Hi guys, in this video we're going to see an example of how to apply local search to a combinatorial optimization problem and in particular we're going to apply it to the traveling salesman problem. The first thing we have to decide when dealing with an optimization problem with meta heuristics is how we're going to represent candidate solutions. And in the traveling salesman problem, there is a natural representation, which is with the permutations of, of a list of integers. Basically, what we're going to do is to assign an integer to each city we want to visit, and then the different uh, tours we can, we can do would be permutations of, of this list, right? So an example would be the one you can see here where we would start at city number three, then we would go to city number six, then to number four, seven, and the last city we would visit in the tour would be number five. And then uh, remember this uh, tour, a cyclical tour, so we have to go back to our original city where, where we departed from. One thing we can think of is, okay, so what's the size of the search space? And we've got the permutations of, of n, so, so that would be n factorial, right? It's, it's the number of ways we can sort n cities in, in a list. Actually, you can, you can make uh, this size a little bit smaller, realizing two things that one is that the, when you think about tours, the, the city where you start is irrelevant, right? Because you, you're going to go back. So, so that makes uh, the size of the search space be rather than n factorial, n minus 1 factorial. Because we, we could arbitrarily set the initial city. We could fix this initial city to number three or, or whichever number, but to, to one number, and, and we would be um, solving the same problem. So it's actually n minus one factorial. And then also once you see a tour, you can um, travel that tour in one direction or in the reverse direction. So, so actually, the the size of the search space is n minus one factorial divided by two if you're a little bit um, smart defining it but but th this is more like a curiosity rather than uh, a very important thing for the purpose of of this video so so if you want to assume it's it's n factorial that that's perfectly okay for for now okay the notation we're going to use is we're going to denote each of these candidate solutions with letter S for solution and the components of a candidate solution would be S subscript and, and an integer denoting the, the position of, of the city in, in our tour. So what we have to do now is to formalize our goal and our goal is to find um, the shortest possible tour, the, the tour that has the shortest possible length. So what we want to minimize is the length of the tour, so we have to formalize the, the length of, of any possible tour. And the length of any possible tour is just this formula down here, which is computing the distance between consecutive cities in our tour and then adding the distance from um, the last uh, visit, the, the last city we visit to our uh, initial city, which is this last term over here. Okay, so th this is our goal, and and it would be fairly easy to compute the length of any tour because we know um, the distance between each pair of cities. That that's uh, part of the data of the problem. The next thing we have to decide is in which initial solution we want to start. What, what tour uh, we want to use as our initial solution for, for the local search. Because remember, in local search, we start uh, at, a, at an initial solution, and then we look at neighboring solutions, and, and we try to, 
to move in this case downhill in the landscape of lengths of, of, of solutions. So where, where should we start? Well, when we don't know much about the problem, a natural way, a natural uh, choice as an in initial solution would be a random permutation, a, a random solution. If we, if we don't know much about it, well, th this is this is one way we we can do it, and it's um, it's a way that that is used um, very often. This step, the fourth step, which is the definition of the neighborhood, is the most important step at the time of using local search. Okay. The definition of the neighborhood is going to be conditioned uh, by the representation of the solutions that we've chosen um, previously. And in this case, we've chosen to represent solutions with uh, permutations of, of integers. And one natural way of defining neighborhood would be using what is called the swap operator. The swap operator basically consists in you have a tour and what you're going to do is to swap the place of, of two cities you want to visit. OK, so in this case, if you have a tour, one possible tour is the one we can see here. Um, and we we select the city that we visit in the third place and the city we visit in the seventh place and we swap those those cities and and the neighborhood would be defined with the following statement two candidate solutions are neighbors if and only if they differ in just one swap in in two elements basically okay how many neighbors are there for a certain uh, solution well that would be the number of ways we can choose two elements from a set of n elements and that's that's n choose 2, which is n times n minus 1 divided by 2. That would be the number of uh, the, the, the size of the neighborhood if we uh, choose the swap operator. And this would be a pretty simple way of implementing the neighborhood. And, and in principle, it would be OK. But for the traveling salesman problem, it, it, has, it, it has an issue here. We, we have an issue. And the issue is that this definition of neighborhood does not have a strong locality for the traveling salesman problem. What does that mean? Well, it means that if we define neighborhoods um, like this, we're going to find neighbors that do not have similar quality. And that is not good. That is not good um, for local search because if neighbors do not have similar quality, then local search is not going to perform a minimal, a meaningful search in, in the landscape. OK, so let, let's see first why I say that um, defining a neighborhood with a swap operator for the traveling salesman problem will not give us a strong locality. And, and we're going to see it with this example. And we're going to see that here we've got two neighbors, these two that we've seen here, that differ a lot in their quality. The length of the tours are very different. And yeah, if we swap here city number three and city number seven, what we arrive at is this other tour where we have changed um, four links in, in this graph of, of the tour. And that potentially will have major consequences for the length of, of the tour. So basically, this definition of neighborhood, even though it's very easy to implement in the traveling salesman problem, it doesn't have a strong locality. And, and therefore, we shouldn't use it because local search will not work uh, well. Are there any other alternatives um, that may have a stronger locality? Yes, 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 there are. So what we've seen is that in the traveling salesman problem, what is important is adjacency. We don't want to change many of these links. So one way we could define the neighborhood is the following. We say that uh, two solutions are neighbors if and only if they differ only in two of these edges or, or two of these links. Links and, and edges are, are the same thing. And that is 
uh, what we have uh, represented in, in this slide where we've used what is called the two edge exchange operator or the two opt operator where basically we're just changing uh, two links in, in this graph and by changing just two links uh, to find a neighbor, uh, the neighbor that we find will have uh, a similar quality because we're just changing to two of these uh, links. This operator is slightly more complicated to implement, but, but that's not uh, such a big deal. The, the good thing is that it will have a stronger locality than the swap neighborhood for the traveling salesman problem and therefore it would be more appropriate. Uh, this kind of neighborhood, the two edge exchange uh, neighborhood, can be generalized, and we can uh, we can define the k edge exchange, where neighbor solutions differ by at most k edges. This, in principle, would be better because we would be looking at um, at, at at more neighbors. The neighborhood would be much bigger uh, and therefore we would be able to perform um, a wider search in, in the landscape. But on the other hand, um, uh, computing this neighborhood would take longer. It would take longer to look at more neighbors. So, so the, the, there will be a trade-off there. And uh, the, the, usual is tra uh, the usual trade-off between speed on the one hand and quality of the final solution. So, so initially, well, depending on, on how much time we have, we, we should probably use a two edge or, or K edge, where K would be greater than two. Okay, so are these neighborhoods always better for any kind of problem? Nope, nope. Uh, there, there are types of problems like the um, uh, permutation scheduling problem that we're going to implementing our programming classes for which this definition of neighborhood the the k edge or the two edge exchange are not appropriate and and the swap operator and other operators like the insertion operator would be more appropriate uh, the swap operator is the one we saw before and that would be more appropriate for permutation scheduling problems than the two edge exchange operator. Why is that? Because in permutation scheduling problems, what is important is not adjacency, like in the traveling salesman problem. What is important is the relative order uh, between the numbers. In, in that case would be jobs, but, but what is important is, is we want to define a neighborhood in such a way that neighbors preserve much of the relative order um, uh, that, that we have. And if you think about it, the swap operator preserves much of the relative uh, order. All the, all the numbers in white preserve the, the relative order. And because of that, because the relative order is what is important in, in permutation scheduling problems, using the swap operator to define a neighborhood would be appropriate in that case. Another uh, definition of neighborhood that would also be appropriate for permutation scheduling problems would be the using the insertion uh, operator, where you choose one um, one position and you insert it in another place. Okay, and these two would be would be good for scheduling permutation problems, but but not for the traveling salesman problem. While this one, the one we saw before, the two X exchange, wouldn't be good for permutation scheduling problems because it doesn't preserve um, the relative order very well. If, if you think um, this change of two links, of two edges, in terms of the representation of the solution is this change that we can see here. And as you can see, uh, the relative order is not preserved a, a lot by by any means. So, so to conclude, I mean, what is important about these two slides is that when you define the neighborhood, you you have to take into account the type of problem that you're solving because depending on the type of problem, 
the definition of the neighborhood may have a, a strong locality or may have weak locality. And this is something that is not obvious at, at first sight, but, but you really have to take into account because we have to define the neighborhood with, with a strong locality in such a way that neighbors have similar uh, quality. So, so local search will, will work well in that case. Okay, what's the next thing we have to decide? Well, the selection mechanism, okay? Uh, in local search, we, we have to select one of the neighbors but we've seen different ways we can uh, select one neighbor. We, we've seen three in the, in the previous video. We saw best improvement, first improvement, and random selection and local search. And in principle, um, you, you could use any, any of these. Any, any of these would be appropriate. Then we have to decide uh, when to stop, a stop criterion. And a natural one uh, in local search is to stop at a local optimum, to stop where to stop at a solution that is the best in its neighborhood. Okay, that's that's a local optimum. And in this case, since we're minimizing the length, we would stop at a route such that any neighboring route is as long or longer than, than the one we're looking at. And that, that would be a, a local optimum. What we have to realize as well, and, and this is important, is that this definition of local optimum relates to, to the neighborhood, okay? So for the same optimization problem, like for instance, the traveling salesman problem, a local optimum for a certain type of neighborhood may not be a local optimum for another type of neighborhood. And this is something also that that we have to take into account. OK, so what kind of solution would we arrive if we implement local search as we, as we have discussed? Well, we would arrive at things like this, like what we can see in this slide. Uh, this is the traveling salesman problem for the 532 ATT switch locations in the States. And, and one solution we may find is, is this one that we can see, which doesn't look very good. Okay, but, but it is a, a local optimum. It, it means that this solution is the best in its neighbor, in, in its neighborhood, sorry. While the optimum solution with uh, is this one and and the problem with local search is that we're going to end up in a local optimum but in many problems like in the traveling salesman problem uh, the landscape is very rugged that means that it has many peaks many valleys and many local optima so so it's likely that the local optimum that we end up may be far away from the global optimum. And that is a problem we, we have with local search. This is another example of a, a traveling salesman problem with a number of locations in, in Berlin. And this is another local optimum where we may end up if we use local search. In this case, um, the neighborhood that was used was the two edge exchange operator the the one where two solutions are neighbors if they differ in in two links and since this is a local optimum what we know is that it is not possible to change two edges in this graph and and make the route shorter that is what what local optimum means Okay, so what are the problems with local search? Well, we've discussed them already, right? The problem is that we convert usually very fast to local optima. And, and in which local optimum we may end up depends also on the initial solution. So for problems like the one we can see here, where the landscape is very rugged and there are many peaks, many valleys, uh, it is likely that uh, the local optimum where we end up will be maybe far away from the global optimum. Okay, so how, how can we escape 
a local optimum that is not very good. So th there are many different approaches and um, most of them fall into one of these three categories. Uh, the first one is, okay, since um, the local optimum where we end up will depend on our initial solution, let's start at different initial solutions. So, so we will end up in different local optima and, and then we will select the best local optimum uh, that we have found. And, and that is a, a valid approach, starting in different initial solutions. Another approach consists in changing the landscape of the problem. And you can do this in different ways. One way would be to add a little bit of noise. So when you're stuck in a local optimum, you add a little bit of noise to the objective function and, and you may you may escape. Another way is when you're stuck in one local optimum, you change the neighborhood fun function. And we've seen that, that local optimum uh, for certain neighborhood functions may not be local optima for other neighborhood functions. So by changing the neighborhood function, you may escape one local optimum. And the last approach is accepting non-improving neighbors. So remember local search is all about going downhill if, if you want to minimize. So every iteration in the algorithm um, requires that you make an improvement. You're, you're going to, to go downhill, but it may be the case that from time to time, it may be worth uh, accepting non-improving neighbors, making moves in a non-improving direction in order to explore a wider range of the, of the landscape. And each of these different approaches uh, has led to different algorithms in the literature. Um, the one where the approach where we iterate with different solutions has led to, to these algorithms. Um, if you want to change the landscape of the problem, we've seen you can do it by changing the objective function and uh, maybe by adding some noise or by making that function a little bit smoother. Another way you can change the landscape the landscape of the problem is to use different neighborhood functions. And the last uh, approach that we're going to see uh, with greater detail in the next video, it consists in accepting non-improving neighbors. And, and this approach has led in particular to two um, very famous algorithms. One is taboo search and the other one is simulated annealing that we're going to study in the next uh, list of videos and we're going to implement in the programming classes. So with this, we finish this video. I, I hope you, it, it was reasonably clear. And if it wasn't, remember, you can always email me and, and we can discuss and anything you like. Uh, okay, guys, thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Cheers.